Kia ora. Uh, thank you, Jane, Alberto, Petra. Thank you very much for organising today. Um, so I was coming down from Auckland and we were with my kids and we were about to go to the movies and the media rang me up and they said, we'd like a comment on something. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, there's this new bug in China and a few people are freaking out about it. And this is in uh, late January. And so I said, World Health Organization has a fantastic procedure. It's all under control. It'll be dealt with in two weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> you learn from what you say, and it's a very public mistake, but it, it led to a, a lot of reflection about the systems that we have and the way that we position ourselves and how we go forward. And so I've been involved in a lot of the COVID debates, but the one I want to talk about today is one I'm working on with Sir Peter Gluckman and Sir Jim McClay. And Sir Peter Gluckman, as most of you know, was the former science advisor to the Prime Minister. And what we were, have been looking at is the way that the notification process worked with the current situation. And so it, international law, as, as we know, is a relatively new creature from the 19th century. And it starts off largely with international health law. And the first commitment from 1851, we, we didn't actually get to a notification rule until the turn of the 20th century. We argued that those before us about the price of postage about what should be said, about what we should count, and it was, it was as you would expect. But then we got the, the rule in 1903 that each government shall immediately notify the other governments of the first appearance of the authentic cases of plague and cholera, and you must do it through diplomatic channels. And that, that rule, um, it, it changes over the, the following decades. We look at different things, we count different diseases, we look at different criteria, we made it compulsory in 1926, and, and that was good. And in 1969, we added the importance of having weekly telegrams so that we could inform each other of developments. And we proceed through until you get to the, the current iteration. And I've learned so much today, but one thing I've noticed is that we've all become scholars on the international health regulations. And we, we've all taken apart different sections of it, and we've all learned something. And, and so the current rules we have are uh, Article 6, Article 7, and Article 8. And it's, it's rules about shall notify within 24 hours that there shall be evidence that may constitute and this sh may be consultation. The, the point I wish to make about the, the language in the 21st century is it's effectively the same language as it was at the end of the 19th and in the early 20th. It's evolved a little bit, but not a lot. And then, since then, um, because obviously COVID is not the most recent, or it is the most recent problem, but we've had others since 2005. We've had three reviews of the regulations, and in 2009, one of the points was that we needed to have more work on the early response mechanism. We had another review in 2015, each one with a different health emergency. Uh, again, there was more work needed on early notification. And then again with the uh, 2016 with Ebola. And once more, we need to facilitate better early warning systems. And through the background of that, we have the Sustainable Development Goals. And they also are talking about, in goal number three, the importance of early notification. And so we, we got to this point where, where Jim, myself and Peter are talking, and it becomes apparent that before we even got to COVID, there was a challenge with early notification. And it's just that this time, we've had to really refocus about what we could do. So, we, we sat down, we had a lot of time on our hands because we were in the middle of lockdown, and we thought, well, how can we redo it? And so the, the process we've got at the moment is uh, we're working through a lot of scientific groups that Sir Peter has connection to. But it's, it's so we're, we're, in a, we're in a science vehicle, but it's troublesome because you've got the three processes. You've got the Clark Review, You've got the review of the regulations, and the big one in the room is what will Biden do? Because Biden himself, obviously he wants to rejoin the WHO, but I do expect he may be a little bit more hawkish on some things than we actually think he, we want him, to be, want him to be. So we've got three things in one room, and we thought, well, how can we change what we've got? And we thought the best way to change is not to make a new will, but to look at the way things have been dealt with elsewhere that we've already agreed to. And so try to get a 21st century protocol with ideas from other areas of international law. And so the, the first principle we came up with was that you need a protocol. You don't need another World Health Organization. You need something that would be separate to it 
that would add to it. But you don't want to supplant the, the decision making, the analysis, the political considerations. The second thing we thought about was the obligation of risk warning. And for that, we looked at what happened in Europe with the nuclear, with when Chernobyl exploded and the obligation thereafter, because you always, international law is always reactive. We're never proactive. We always have to wait for something bad to happen. And so we thought that makes sense, that there's the obligation in law, not just a regulation, but that it's very strong. The third principle is independence in science. You have to separate the, the scientists from the decision makers. And for this, we looked at the way that air pollution had been dealt with in Europe and the way that they got through some of their biggest difficulties. And the biggest solution they had, put the scientists in one room and let them do what they do and put the politicians in the other. It doesn't mean you have to follow it, but it gives them independence. And we see the same kind of thinking with climate change in the IPCC. Let the scientists do what the scientists do. So we said, that's good. Fourth principle, make the data open and transparent. And again, we looked at the IPCC model. Make sure all data is shared, that it is handed over when it is incomplete even, on a precautionary basis. Don't wait until you've got evidence. So make sure that the flow of information is, is seamless and continual. The fifth one, and we've been working with people in the Chemicals Weapons Convention about this, is a little bit more difficult. And that is the idea that when you have a early notification, you would have the ability, if the entrenched majority agree, to send a team to that country, where you could go in and you could say, is, can we investigate independently? Now obviously there's a lot of caveats around like military facilities and sensitive places, but again, it's the same principle. And then the final idea was that there would be autonomy with the protocol and independent financing. And when we talked about independent financing, the thinking was, the need not just to have traditional state funding, but to also try to tap some of the pockets of some of the other industries out there that seem to be very wealthy at the moment as well. <coughs> so, the idea. So, the, the idea at the moment is, um, is going through a, a number of articles and iterations. And for those of you in law who have never written with scientists before, it's a very different experience. And you never quite learn about protocol until you get 15 names in the line up the top of the letterhead. But we're hoping to get a placement between before uh, the Clark discussions, the review on the regulations, and we've also got a contact within hopefully the next Biden administration. That's it.